Hey folks, Attorney Anna Brecke here for Law of Self-Defense with another pre-recorded show as I'm on the road. This one, uh, the second one being recorded in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma at the wonderful Ambassador Hotel. Strongly recommended, very nice hotel. As I continue my journey back home from this past weekend's S12 training event outside of Nashville where I taught and uh, proceed on my way back home to Metro Denver. Well, south of Denver. And uh, during my journey, I'm, of course, recording these for Law of Self-Defense relatively short shows on the road. And this one involves a convenience store robbery. So a convenience store clerk in Concord, California, finds himself the victim of a felony robbery carried out by a masked woman wielding a large knife. At various points, she's holding the point of the knife within inches of the clerk's neck making demands that he cannot accommodate. Uh, the robbery is captured on video, so we're going to watch the video. There's no gore, there's no injury in this video, but we will see, of course, this female robber threatening the clerk with the knife. The clerk's entirely compliant with the robbery. He makes no effort to either resist the robber's demands or to defend himself against the threats, even when the robber momentarily places her knife down on the register within reach of the clerk in order for the robber to more expeditiously rifle the register drawer. Could the clerk have seized the knife? Could he have then used it on the robber lawfully? Could the clerk, if he'd been armed with a pistol, have used that pistol as deadly defensive force upon the robber? Should the clerk have attempted to flee the threat of the pointed knife. All of that and more is what we'll discuss in today's Law of Self-Defense show. So let's go ahead and launch the formal start of today's show. So I saw this uh, convenience store robbery um, being talked about on Twitter, but it looks like it was uh, the video of the robbery was sourced from Facebook. So I'll share that with all of you in just a moment. Before we do, of course, we have the sponsor of today's show, which is none other than Law of Self-Defense itself, our best-selling book, Law of Self-Defense Principles. We'd like to make this book available to you for free. This is the handbook to how to be hard to convict if you're ever compelled to use force, especially deadly force, in defense of yourself, your family, your property, all in plain English. I encourage you to check it out on Amazon. It's five-star rated, great reviews, but don't buy it on Amazon. They'll charge you for the book and the shipping. We only ask that you cover the cost of shipping the book to you. The cost of the book itself, we eat. So we provide the book for free in that respect. You can take advantage of this opportunity. It's a real physical book, folks, not just a PDF download or something. You can get your own copy of this book for free, but for the shipping at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. All right. So as I mentioned, I saw news reporting discussion of this Concord, California robbery on Twitter, but the video was actually on Facebook. So let's take a look at what accompanied the video on Facebook. Just a little bit of text here. Uh, Police in Concord, California are asking for the public's help in finding a female suspect seen on newly released surveillance video demanding cash from an employee at a car wash. Oh, not a convenience store, car wash. Hmm. While brandishing a large knife inches from his face, the suspect, who wore a black bandana and latex gloves, ran out of the store after taking cash from the drawer. Yes, so correction, this was a car wash, I guess not a convenience store. So let's take a look now at the actual video itself. Uh, We'll see, of course, the clerk on the left sitting behind the register. The robber's coming in on the right. She's reaching into her jacket now to present the knife. I'll run it through straight through. It's almost uh, just under a minute long, and uh, then I'll comment on specific portions of it. Okay. All right. Okay. Open the safe. 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 Open the safe.
I can't do it. Open the safe. Look at it. Open the safe. I can't open it. Open the safe. I can't do it. Open the safe. I said I can't open the safe. Open the safe. I don't have three. Open the safe. I'm only working. Open the safe. It's my boss. The one who called my boss. Open the safe. I can't do it. Open the safe. I said I can't do it. Open the safe. I said I can't do it. And there she goes. She looks like she should do a little more recreational running. That might be helpful to her. All right. So uh, first of all, this uh, this whole open to safe dialogue uh, is pretty disturbing. So I've worked convenience store jobs. I've worked gas station jobs. I've worked jobs where we had one form or another of a what we would call a drop safe. When you accumulate a certain amount of cash in the drawer, you don't want it to be available to a robber. So in the gas station job, we had a safe that uh, a cylindrical safe buried in the cement of the floor, just a little round door with a combination and a slot into which you could put folded uh, paper money. Um, and the little cylindrical door had a handle on it to uh, once you did undid the combination, I suppose you pull up the handle, the door just completely comes out and uh, you could reach in and get the contents. Guess who did not have the combination to that safe, folks? I didn't have the combination. No way for me to access the contents of that safe. Uh, all I could do was drop money in. I could not get money out. Um, and if you're imagining that you might wrap a chain or something around uh, the handle of the door to uh, rip the safe open, all you would do is rip the handle off the off the door, off the safe door. So, uh, but if someone had come in to rob the place, uh, I would have had to say what this clerk is saying: I can't open the safe. The repeated demands to open the safe. I mean, maybe this person, maybe this robber's never worked in a convenience store. Maybe they've never worked. Who knows? Um, but is, is it alarming that she repetitiously makes this demand? The clerk knows he cannot satisfy, and she's doing it at the point of a knife, threatening death, waving the point of the knife within inches of his neck, demanding over and over again, open the safe, open the safe, open the Does this look like, would a reasonable person infer that unable to satisfy this robber's demands, they're about to get stabbed? Would stabbing be deadly force, likely to cause death or serious bodily injury, especially to the neck? Really, any any stab with a knife of this length would likely be fatal. Uh, knives cause, cause uh, absolutely horrific injuries, folks. Uh, so let's take a look here at what we have. California. So one question that might arise is... Uh, should this clerk have simply have tried to create more distance between himself and the knife? Uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> uh, he can't. He can't. There's a counter behind him. He's in a little L-shaped island here. There's no way for him to back up. So in terms of the five elements of self-defense, innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness, when you're threatened with a contact weapon, there are jurisdictions, 11 of them, that say, well, if you can safely retreat without having to use deadly force in self-defense, and this is particularly relevant when you're being threatened with a contact weapon because distance creates safety from the contact weapon, right? If you're far enough away, they can't hurt you with the contact weapon. Uh, then you're obligated to do that. These are duty to retreat states. You have a legal duty to retreat before you can use deadly force in self-defense. If retreat is possible with complete safety, two things there. One, complete safety. You're not required to increase your jeopardy in an effort to retreat. If someone's this close to you with a knife, can you practically, with complete safety, safety retreat, even if there's a path for you to take, without them stabbing you in the back? It would seem unlikely, right, given this proximity and a knife of this length. Can you run backwards as quickly as someone, the aggressor, can run forwards? No. So you have to turn. So you have anything like the speed of departure that they have in the speed of speed of pursuit. And does turning take time? Sure. So I would suggest that in, on these facts, even if the clerk had a path of safe, safe retreat, uh, it could not be done without him increasing his jeopardy and therefore the legal duty. Even in the 11 states, there's only 11 states that are duty to retreat states. He would not have had that legal duty because he could not do it with complete safety. In any case, he does not have an actual path of retreat because he's trapped in this little L-shaped island. Further, this occurred in California. And you may be surprised to hear this, 
But California is a stand-your-ground state. In fact, it's one of the most aggressive stand-your-ground states in the country. Under Now, you won't find a California stand-your-ground statute. They don't have a stand-your-ground statute, but statutes are not the only form of law. Another form of law is case law, appellate court decisions, just as valid as statutory law. And California has appellate court decisions going back to the late 1800s, making clear that under California law, there is no legal duty to retreat before you can defend yourself. Indeed, 2023 California jury instructions, Cal Crim 505, and you could read these yourself at lawofselfdefense.com slash 505. tells the jury, instructs the jury, that not only does the defendant not have a legal duty to retreat, the defendant is permitted to pursue his attacker if necessary for his safety. That's a pretty aggressive stand your ground standard. So even if this clerk had had the means to escape with complete safety and had had a practical path of escape, it still would not have been legally required under California law. So that takes care of the element of avoidance. What about the element of innocence? Is the clerk the unlawful initial physical aggressor here? Obviously not. He's the victim of a felony armed robbery. Uh, Imminence is the threat an imminent threat. Well, yeah, throughout pretty much the entirety of this encounter. Right here, the knife comes out. Within six seconds of this video starting, six seconds of this robber approaching the counter. Is there an imminent threat here? Ability, opportunity, jeopardy. That's how we define imminence for use of force law purposes. Does the robber have the ability to cause harm? Clearly. I mean, we all have some ability. In fact, here the ability is deadly force harm in the in the form of a knife. We'll cover that when we get to proportionality. Does the, does the robber have the opportunity to bring the knife to bear? Is she close enough? Yes. Jeopardy. Is the robber conducting themselves in a way that a reasonable person would infer she intends to bring that ability and opportunity to bear? Yes. Say, OJ, we have an imminent threat. As already mentioned, the element of proportionality, the threat is deadly in nature. Avoidance, we've already addressed. Reasonableness, is the clerk reasonably perceiving the nature of this threat? And does he have a subjective belief that he's being threatened with unlawful deadly force harm? Let's. I think the, I think the evidence supports reasonableness here. He's not imagining she has a knife, right? So we have all the elements required from this moment for lawful deadly force self-defense. If this clerk had a pistol on his person, could he draw that pistol right now and shoot this robber lawfully? Yes. Not only for the five elements reasons, but in most states, of course, you can also use deadly force to stop a felony crime, a forcible felony crime, which is certainly what's happening here. But even independent of the forcible felony privilege, um, you'd have the privilege under the standard of lawful self-defense here. From this moment, because he, the clerk, is reasonably perceiving that he's facing an unlawful, eminent threat of deadly force harm, he'd be privileged to use deadly force in self-defense. He's got nowhere to go. He's backed in this corner, being completely compliant. Now the clerk puts the knife down. Could, no, I'm sorry, the robber puts the knife down on the, pull this back up. I advanced the video a little bit. Uh, Now the knife is on top of the register. Is the robber still presenting as an imminent deadly force threat? Yes, because imminence doesn't mean only what's actually occurring in the moment. It means what's immediately about to occur. This is a felony armed robbery with a knife in progress. The the robber didn't throw the knife across the room. The robber simply placed the knife in a position where she could imminently wield it again at the robber, which is ultimately, of course, what she does. Would the clerk here have been privileged of grabbing the knife and using it on the robber? Well, certainly legally, he'd be permitted to grab the knife, seize control of the knife. Once he had control of the knife, would he be privileged to use it on the robber? Well, that becomes a more ambiguous question. Is the robber still presenting as a deadly force threat if the robber's lost the knife and the clerk has taken possession of the knife? You could argue no. You could argue that the imminent deadly force threat presented by the clerk ended the moment the clerk had control of the knife. 
Now, if the robber decides to fight for control of the knife and there's a struggle over the knife, then the imminent deadly force threat is there again. So the clerk could seize the knife. Whether or not he could then use the knife depends on whether or not the robber would continue to present as an imminent deadly force threat. Uh, what if the... Uh, of course, the clerk would still be privileged here to present a pistol if he wanted to. Can he present a pistol now that the knife is on the register? Yes, because as already discussed, the robber is still presenting as an imminent deadly force threat. The knife is still accessible within ready reach. And afar, as we know, that's what the robber ultimately does. Now, I know the clerk doesn't have a gun. Um, he's uh, probably ordered by management not to be armed. He'd probably be fired, if, uh, lose his job if he were to use a gun to defend himself or defend the property. Um, well, here, he's really just defending himself, obviously. He does clearly doesn't care about the money. He's more than happy for the robber to take the money out of the register. So he'd only be defending himself. Could he use deadly force just to defend the, the money here? Not in California, right? Perhaps in Texas, but not in any of the 49 other states, and certainly not in California. But there is, of course, here a threat to person. So this is really a self-defense scenario, not a defensive property scenario. So yes, of course, the clerk doesn't have a gun. It's California. Um, I don't know where Concord, California is, but in many places in California, it can be difficult to get a license to carry a gun. Uh, but that's not the legal question. The legal question is, if the clerk were armed with a pistol, could he use it to defend himself in this circumstance? And the answer is unquestionably yes, at least up to this point. where the robber is now in flight from the premises. Is the robber here still presenting as an imminent deadly force threat to the clerk or anybody else, any other innocent person we can see? No. So arguably by this point, when the robber's fleeing, the privilege to use deadly defensive force is ended. Now, if you're going to use the forcible felony justification, you might argue that technically, at least in terms of charging the robber, uh, the felony is still in progress during the flight from the scene, that's not an argument I'd want to be making on behalf of a client whose welfare I cared about. If the threat is over, folks, then I would, I don't tell people what to do, uh, but you don't have a straight up self-defense argument anymore. You'd be using a much more ambiguous forcible felony argument. So arguably the, the privilege to use deadly defensive force would have ended here because the eminence would have ended. The window of eminence is closed and the robber is no longer presenting as a deadly force threat. <clears throat> All this stuff. By the way, if you were a customer at this car wash and you walked in upon this scene and you had a pistol on your person, would you be privileged to use deadly defensive force against this robber, even though the robber is not threatening you? Arguably, yes, you could use the same force in defense of others, in defense of the clerk, that the clerk would be privileged to use. So to the extent the clerk's privileged to use deadly defensive force in his own defense, you would be privileged to use deadly defensive force in defense of the clerk. It, now, normally in defense of others, there's a lot of ambiguity risk, right? You, you may turn a corner, see two people fighting. You don't really know what's going on. Is there any ambiguity here? Really? Uh, it, it would seem not. Uh, there are weird circumstances in which, you know, one person might attack another with a knife and they struggle over the knife and then the original victim gets control of the knife. Uh, but then they generally are not conducting themselves in this manner. Uh, again, I don't tell people what to do or not do. I, I do always urge caution in any kind of defense of others scenario. Uh, in a tip defense of others scenario, two people fighting largely because of ambiguity risk uh, in a, in a, unambiguous active shooter type of scenario. I, I still urge caution because they're, they're, the risk is not really legal, uh, but of course it is a deadly force encounter in which you could die, either be shot by the active shooter or be shot by another armed citizen who mistakes you for the active shooter or by police as they fled the scene looking for a dude with a gun. All right, folks. I don't think there's anything else I wanted to discuss here. Just a short one, a short one for all of you uh, as I work my way back home and back to the office. So <clears throat> at this point, I'll just remind all of you, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. If you carry a knife, so you're hard to kill. If you carry pepper spray, so you're hard to kill. If you study jujitsu, so you're hard to kill. I do all those things. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. 
If you do any of those things, or hopefully all those things yourself, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict as well. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.